Good morning, uh, good evening, and welcome to the 2021 Horasis Asia meeting. I am delighted to be hosting this panel today with, uh, with colleagues and friends across uh, Asia. My name is Adrian Mutton. I'm the CEO and founder of a company called SunMS4, which was founded in India in 2008. And we represent the local interests across India and Asia for a range of universities, international non-profit organizations and corporations who are seeking to enter and expand into those markets. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined on the call today by Sushma Paul Berlia from the APJ Group in India, from Edgar Bulisier uh, in the Philippines, who's the chief executive of the Pagalas Group, uh, Alberto Ferga, who's the founder and chief executive officer of Amara Holdings in Bali, Indonesia, and Claire Chen, who's the managing partner of SZ LCI Source Consulting Group in Taiwan. So a very strong representation from across Asia. Welcome uh, to my fellow panelists. Uh, in today's session, we are going to be talking about the impact of COVID and supporting the underprivileged um, through and beyond the pandemic era and ensuring that there is a continued promotion of wealth and well-being across <laughs> Asia. Clearly, the pandemic has had an adverse react on the poor societies of Asian communities. Unfortunately, we've seen a tremendous impact on employment, on health and well-being through the region. The estimated increase in global poverty in 2020 is truly unprecedented. In the two decades since 1999, the number of li people living in extreme poverty had actually fallen by a billion people. However, during the COVID uh, pandemic, it is believed that many of those will be plunged back into poverty. And once again, we have an enormous uh, economic, financial and, and well-being gap. My panelists today will make a brief introduction uh, about their own personal and professional experience from the countries and the regions that they represent. And then we will go into a conversation uh, to set out some of the challenges, some of the opportunities, which indeed the pandemic does present, and some of the solutions that both we in the private sector, those in the public sector, and in the non-profit sector can adopt to make mm -hmm. a real difference, which is of course at the a core of, of the ethos of the Harassis meetings. So, good morning, welcome. Uh, I'd like to open up, please, uh, with Sushma, if you'd like to introduce yourself and make some opening remarks. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much, Adrian. Uh, I am the chairperson of the APJ Satya and the Soran Group. Uh, while we are also present internationally, we have a very significant presence in India. I myself live in Delhi. And I chair both the corporate as well as the educational uh, contributions of our group. We have about 26 schools, colleges, and a university, and are present in uh, pharmaceuticals, real estate, and some of the light sectors. Uh, I mention this because I think, uh, obviously, when I'm sharing my experiences, uh, they would be around the areas where, you know, we have been working a little more closely than otherwise. Um, from our point of view, when the pandemic just came in, it was we sort of saw the lockdown coming into India because we already saw U.S. shutting down. We saw the, air, you know, the flight shutting down from different parts of the country, and we felt it wasn't going to be very long. So, fortunately, because of that insight, we were able to reach out very, very quickly. We employ almost ten thousand people across different sectors directly apart from a whole host of indirect people who are dependent upon us. And what we did was we went into huge virtual mode interaction at different levels. But on the ground, um, you know, we had two tasks. One was to manage our own people and the other was to see what we could do in terms of how we could contribute to uh, whoever that we could. Uh, it was a terrible time, I can tell you, not even so much the first phase in India that came in 2000, 
um, 20, but I think the phase that we just went through, the second phase of pandemic in uh, April and May, and uh, where we had a situation where literally by the minute we were getting phone calls, not only from our own employees, their families, but friends and anybody that we knew wanting some kind of help that we could facilitate them with, whether it was oxygen, whether it was hospital beds. Uh, sometimes it was also because most of the members were sick, so they weren't even able to cook food or have access to grocery. It was absolutely heartrending for us, I can tell you this. Uh, during the second phase of the pandemic, I was caught out in uh, U.S. at that time. And, uh, you know, myself and my three children who are basically uh, comprising the board and looking after the organization, I can say that for two months, literally, I don't think we would have slept beyond two, three, four hours. I mean, we couldn't. It's the thing was that it wasn't just an issue of ourselves being able to give help, but the most important thing that mattered was putting people together. So it was wonderful because there was a whole lot of people who were also reaching out to us across the globe who knew us, who wanted to contribute in some way. But then they didn't, not all of them necessarily wanted to give to the government. They wanted to reach out to the actual people on the ground. And because of my connect as a former president of the Chamber of Commerce, my involvement with Rotary Club and some of the other social uh, organizations that we were engaged with, uh, we were able to do a lot of that facilitation in the process. So, you know, having oxygen plants set up in hospitals, even government hospitals didn't have those. Uh, there were a lot of times when, you know, food kitchens had to be set up or food grains had to be sent out. Um, so it was almost like becoming a logistics come sourcing expert, if you will. One of the greatest learnings that we've definitely had during that period is how important it is to have a sort of a facilitation uh, center, agency, virtual platform, which could actually put people together. In fact, when we talk about the roadmaps, I think this is one of the most significant things that can be done. The other was we really felt the absence of a steering committee which could come encompass at least the country as a whole, because India, as you know, not everything can be done by the center. So while the center was very keen to do a lot of things, and so were the states, there wasn't sufficient coordination taking place, which is not difficult to imagine, because obviously many of the people in the public sector and the government in particular were themselves impacted by the pandemic. I mean, we even had government officers reaching out to us asking for help. On the other hand, what was so heartrending were our teachers and our students because almost immediately we went online. Fortunately, we were investing a lot in technology even before pandemic hit. And I mean technology not just in terms of administration, but curriculum, learning management systems. We went completely into cloud in 2010. All our people, our teachers, our staff, everybody was well educated in the use of computers. Were had a lot of them already had access to laptops, but then we were able to trigger an immediate purchase because we felt that this is the need of the hour. And in that process, we found that you know we were able to move virtually very very quickly, and not just in terms of just hosting a lecture by the teachers to the students, but to really make it into an effective learning system, not only in terms of knowledge, but also being able to keep everybody engaged. Because the biggest issue also was the state of mind, whether it was students who were sort of locked up inside the house, whether it were the teachers who, while they were trying to teach, were managing their families, managing sickness at home, People living in very, very small places, everybody trying to be virtually on something or the other. Many of our students couldn't afford digital devices. So a lot of it, while we were contributing ourselves, we also found there were a lot of private sector organizations who wanted to help, 
Many, of course, also gave contributions to the government, but they wanted to be able to reach out to those who needed it. So we were able to not only for our own students, but for, again, as part of that facilitation center, if you will, which we set up in terms of ability for people to look out for resources that helped us to put many of them together. What's still very agonizing, of course, is a lot of children who lost both their parents, people who lost a lot of their families, many a time earning members. While we try to help a great deal by either giving flat out scholarships or allowing people to pay their fees over a period of time, it wasn't easy because one had to manage cash flow for within the organization as well. We did take a call that no matter what happens, we were not going to retrench people as far as possible and we didn't cut down on salaries as well. I think it was a very important decision and helped us considerably, not only in keeping the morale high and things moving on the ground as we went up, but more importantly, uh, in transforming the organization. Because eventually one thing came through very quickly, that it's the people who make a difference. What we realized is that going ahead as a roadmap, it's so important for there to be a sort of a steering committee, a platform where people can come together. You can call it matchmaking. The importance of looking at big data analytics and then tracking people. We are very concerned about students we might have lost through the system. And private sector is only the tip of the iceberg. There's a whole lot of students, whether public sector or otherwise, which have just disappeared off the map and we don't know how to get wow. them back. So uh, I think uh, I can go on, but I'll stop here. And uh, then I would love to come back, Edgar, and talk a little about the learnings and how we could uh, sort of look at some of the things we need to perhaps see as part of the roadmap going ahead. Thank you very much. Some some very relevant points there and, and clearly a very personal uh, reflection of, of what was a very, very difficult time in India. Thank you. We will come back to some of those, uh, some of those comments. Uh, Claire, good morning in Taiwan. You're on mute. You're on mute still, Claire. I'll come back to you. Don't worry. Um, uh, Alberto, if I can ask you to introduce yourself. Claire, I will come back to you after Alberto, uh, just to give you time to relax and, and find your speakers. Alberto, sure. Thanks. Thanks, Adrian. Welcome um, from the island of God, Bali, Indonesia. I'm the founder of Amara Holding Limited and also the founder of FinHealth Asia, which is um, what I'm going to talk about most and, and the exposure we have uh, when it comes to the topic of this panel. Um, Bali, obviously, as a top 10 tourist destination, has been hit very hard um, by, by the pandemic. Uh, up until today, there are no uh, international flights coming into Bali. Um, officially, Bali's economy is about 50% dependent on, on tourism. Uh, my personal estimate that that's more likely to be 70 to 80% if you're looking at the entire value chain um, of, of indirect service providers that, that, that depend upon um, uh, tourism. Uh, there is also an export industry. Export numbers were down 30 to 40% depending on, on, on products. We have seen unemployment before pandemic in December 2019 was about 1.67%. Uh, it spiked to almost 6% officially. Uh, what we have also seen is that the number of people that fell below the poverty line, which is in Indonesia or in Bali defined at $30, although I think that's <clears throat> uh, you, you won't get very far with that, but that's the official number. Uh, increased by 200,000 people out of a population of 4.5 million. And <clears throat> what, we, what we are not able to capture entirely is, is the underemployment, um, which means that people officially still have a job, but their income has been cut 
right? Because they're still working in the hotel, but, but they only get 50% of their salary. So we have increase in unemployment, we have increase in underemployment, and we have increase in, 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 in people falling under the, the poverty line. Um, the FinHealth Asia, as the name says, it's about financial health. What we're trying to address are some of the pressing issues, in particular for the, the bottom 50% of the social demographic uh, population. In Indonesia, if you're looking at uh, national income, it's about $3,500 per year. So let's call it $300 um, per month. Um, out of the population of 278, 79 million people, 180 million are the, basically the, the 50% of that. Um, we have a sp special interest in the under and unbanked population. In Indonesia, unbanked are about estimated 80 million people and an additional 40 million underbanked. And <clears throat> What this social demographic has in common, and, and actually the issue is accelerated because of COVID, is the lack of savings, uh, number one. Uh, number two is a dependency and a tendency to rely on consumer credit, which in Indonesia is very expensive. Uh, so the loan shark market does indeed exist uh, and people will knock on your door if you don't pay. So there is there is uh, some social issues around that. And only two, three months ago, somebody was killed on the street because he didn't pay back his loan here in, in Bali, Indonesia. So it's not a, it's it's not a, a horror movie. It's actually a real um, the third issue we're we're trying to address is around the pension crisis, and that's a global crisis. We have that in the OECD uh, 20. Um, it's about an 80 trillion deficit if you're looking at government, corporate, individual uh, pensions. In Indonesia, there's a government pension system, but it only covers uh, just over 10% of the population. And... The issue is that even if you are covered, it's absolutely impossible to to retire because the benefits uh, would just not be sufficient for you. So uh, these are the three things uh, we're trying to address. Um, this is a little bit about me and, and what I'm doing and uh, looking forward to this panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alberto. Some, um, some excellent talking points there. Claire, uh, good morning. Can we try to hear you again. Good morning, everyone. My name is Claire. Uh, I, I am a managing partner of the uh, Samja Litton ISOS Consult Group, also an uh, advisory board member at Leaning Storm Green Tech AG Swiss Space. Um, today, uh, I'm very happy to be in here, and we really need to take it seriously uh, to look at this overall global crisis um, during this COVID. Um, there are 150 million additional children uh, plunged into the poverty due to COVID-19, and according to the UNICEF and the Safe the Children Analysis. And the new analysis revealed the number of children living um, those uh, multi-dimensional poverty uh, without access to education and health and housing, nutrition, or water, and um, has increased by the 15% and since uh, the pandemic, and even more. Um, so we need to into uh, we really need to go to uh, into some details about non. Uh, equality we face for the food supply chain and logistic is a big problem these days due to the COVID and we're gonna solve this problem of this logistic and uh, to make the food supplier um, essential food and education how they could have a short supply into the mainly city uh, people that's what I'm looking at because uh, there's a big shortage of logistic worldwide so I think the government or entrepreneur, uh, enterprises company, business people need to uh, 
think the way how they to support the aviation or the airlines, the cargoes, and and not just uh, looking at the um, 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 just only people because logistics actually is a big problem. It, it will sh- shortage for all kind of supply chains. Um, uh, so, to um, if we look at uh, this, the death rate of the COVID in um, range and the age of groups, it, it is indeed um, uh, needed. So, not a black supply chain who are run by young people. The chance you drop them from the uh, stairs and in your home is the same. So, certified food export is essential to many Asian countries because it gives people a chance to upgrade the food supply chain by better margins. And now, container price pricing uh, is up to the 10 times price of the 2020. And China is controlling with the three with three companies producing the containers and do not produce one container more as before. So this crisis will continue for a longer time. So what government can do or the business people or uh, big enterprises can help each other, they need to act. Uh, the passenger flights a drop, drop a, you know, Crazy. Um, the many airplanes um, leased are uh, grounded. So these can be uh, chartered maybe cheaply by supporting by government, government to support the supply chain. So the buyer will now turn their backs to the original suppliers. So, you know, once the price goes to triple, you know, this is like crazy. Um, this will make the change. Permanently, that's what, what I'm thinking. And losing the clients will happen anyway. But since many governments were too late, um, can be local. Well, what I mean is uh, it, too late, like uh, the, the client. So if they can come back to take care of those logistics problems, solve the problem, then um, Living Store offers a solution to sales, to the farmer's product and supply di- directly to the buyer. And this buyer can be local retailer, hotels and consumers in a very efficient way. The produce is the product and produce all certified and delivered is coming from a circle around the city of 500 km. So that's uh, my view. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. Some some very interesting talking points, which we'll come back to. Someone who I know is uh, is well versed about the challenges around logistics is uh, uh, Edgar Bulusio. So Edgar, good morning uh, in the Philippines. Welcome. I'd love to hear your opening remarks, please. Uh, you're on mute, Edgar. My fourth time to say I'm sorry for forgetting to unmute. Okay, uh, thank you again. Uh, thank you and good morning again, Adrian. Um, um, I am uh, into commercial plantation agriculture here in Mindanao, Philippines. Um, we export uh, Cavendish bananas to major markets in Asia, Middle East, and uh, Japan as primary markets, although we also ship to other countries. Um, we are not so affected by the COVID operations. I mean, not. I would rather term it as we are not so affected by the regulations, um, quarantine, because uh, as an agricultural operation, we are out there in the field. Um, so we have the benefit of enjoying the fresh air. The density of people per area is like maximum of three people per hectare so no no nobody catches us if we do not wear mask because we're not mandated to wear mask if we are so distanced anyway 
uh, but the still the economic impact of the restriction uh, did not spare anyone. People could not travel. Uh, members of the family couldn't just freely visit one another or uh, gather together, which is really part of our culture as social beings, but we couldn't. And now we are into the second year, and just to go through some of my notes, um, um, the effect is not just on the millions of us here in Asia, but we also are aware that it's happening all over the world, uh, perhaps with just a few exceptions. Damage is already da done to many, the lost jobs and the businesses. Although the same adversity also provided economic and perhaps political benefits to others. As they say, in every adversity, there's always an opportunity. So then we hear reports about, we learn reports about some businesses actually uh, making making big, you know, and doing uh, 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 availing of the benefits that it provided. Uh, whether it's in the sector of telecommunications, uh, um, the virtual like this, we're able to gather um, um, uh, in events and with lesser carbon footprints. It also showed the best of humanity. We are able to survive. I mean, uh, it's rarely that you hear of somebody dying of hunger just, uh, just because he lost his job. It showed the best of our being families, you know. We, we know who to, to go to if we don't have rice to cook, as they say, if we don't have food. And then you discover people volunteering their resources to help others. Um, the world's leading nations are also challenged seriously. Nations and cultures are different, radically in many cases. It cannot be generalized on how we respond to the COVID. Uh, every place has its own ways of coping with it. But I agree that it should be a good idea to promote an Asian post-COVID progression. As a matter of fact, it's, it may already be happening, defined or not very clearly. I remember a few days ago during the ASEAN plus one, meaning China summit, uh, there was, uh, I, I guess, uh, 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 highly engaged discussion on how collectively as Asians do we respond to the COVID pandemic. But we are all one in uh, uh, learning from it. Realizing that vaccine does not make us immortal. The hospitals do not save us. How many of our friends, their, their, their friends, relatives, loved ones, people we know, they were okay in their homes, just couldn't breathe. So we had to rush them to the hospital, but couldn't even reach the hospital. Was as soon as they reached the hospital, they pass away. Um, sad, but that's are all realities of life. And we have our respective ways to cope with it. And again, lessons learned that we will emerge stronger. I guess that's all I could share for now. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Edgar. Some some um, some fascinating comments, and again, a, a very local perspective from the Philippines. Uh, I'd like to open up to uh, a discussion amongst the panel, and and Sushma, I'm going to come to you first. You raised uh, a comment about how. Uh, various members of the government reached out to you for support during the pandemic. Uh, uh, like yourself, I'm very active in India. We were very in involved in public-private initiatives, maybe formal, maybe informal, through the pandemic. We'd converted our offices into vaccination centers. Those were obviously responses to the need of the hour. As time goes on and we look to a more short-term turning into the medium term, what areas of collaboration do you see with, uh, with the private sector, such as the, your own and the government, that can make a difference in, in bringing people out of the poverty trap and avoiding anyone else dropping into it in India? You're on, you're, you're, sorry, you're on mute. My turn to say sorry. <laughs> so uh, I just wanted to take a step back very quickly and say, if we look at India, uh, 
as a result of the pandemic, the progress that we had made in adding the numbers to the middle class, which was almost 56 million over the last seven, eight years before pandemic hit, or even if we look at the poverty, the number of people under the poverty line, that was more or less wiped out during the pandemic. So if you look at the poor, um, we actually more or less ended up having at least 50% of the people who we had been able to pull out of the poverty line earlier go back down into it. This is apart from the fact that the impact that it may have had on children in particular, both in terms of uh, their not only access to education, but just going and sinking further down into poverty. And I think the estimation is almost about 15%. The reason I'm saying this is the way I'm looking at it is that the pandemic is not unfortunately actually over. So India has, of course, been engaging in a large vaccination program. And I believe almost 80 percent of the population have have had their first shot. But this is the time now when we are talking about booster shots around the world. And we've already heard yesterday about a new strain of COVID coming in. So the way I was looking at it is that it's extremely important, first of all, that the responses that we make now need to be driven by an analysis of what actually worked and did not work as a response during COVID. And (coughs) equally, whether it is in terms of government policies, whether it is in terms of the you know, the cash program, the food program that the government went into, did it really go into the right hands? Um, The health sector, again, issues there, because while we were struggling with COVID, uh, at the same time, there's a whole lot of pressure right now on the health sector for the simple reason that a lot of people just didn't go to hospitals and or there was no place for the hospitals to treat them at that time. Plus, we are suffering from uh, inflation. Part of it is fueled by the fact that, you know, the economy is again getting up and which is fantastic. But, you know, the the stock markets in India, as we all know, seem to be booming. Companies seem to be giving many of them uh, great results, which is good. But on the other end, if the spectrum is the issue that a lot of MSMEs, which are the main employment generators, have gone down under, a lot of self-employed have gone down under. And therefore, there is a need, first of all, for the public and private sector to come in. I would actually think I would want to advocate (coughs) that steering committee that I was talking about with not only representation of the central and the states, but also representation from the private sector, not only to pool in ideas, best practices, and come together with uh, areas where partnerships can happen. One clear example where this happened beautifully during pandemic was, for example, oxygen plants. So we worked very closely with some of the state governments, quickly identified where they wanted the plants. In a couple of places, the government could finance it. Some places, they didn't have immediate finances coming in. So the private sector also pulled in, but they didn't know where to source those oxygen plants, which seemed to be in sudden short supply across the world. I'm just giving an example where it could work very well. So a lot of those joint efforts bore fruit very strongly at that time. And this is something that can carry on very well. Also in the private sector, apart from the research which would be done by the government, there is a capability of going in and seeing that how some of the responses, whether it came to education and its delivery virtually, as well as the transformatory effort that we should not let go of now, due to the gains that we made during the pandemic in a lot of areas, the teaching learning processes, the capacity building to deal with a whole number of people together, the ability to also uh, conduct assessments on a mass scale and also be able to keep track of the learning program. Uh, 
So this is again a place where I personally believe that it's not that the public sector and the government is not taking its own initiatives. They are doing a lot of good work. They are working on a lot of structural reforms. And that's partly why I think the economy has started booming again. But they need to focus, while they focus on public investments and employment generation areas, they need to have probably a greater dialogue, I believe, with the private sector, where not only can we uh, contribute ideas, but we could act as real partners down the line in the distribution and in unclogging the supply chain. Wonderful. Because the real threat today if I truly believe, is not just the short-term impact on poverty, which I have reasons to believe that if we work together, we can pull ourselves out of it. The real threat is the blooming inflation that we see coming mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. and the fact that things may not end immediately right now. Mm -hmm. So we can't wait for some of those longer-term initiatives to be put into place. Right, right, right. So, some, some excellent comments and you, 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 you clearly articulate how... Uh, public-private partnerships can work. And in fact, in India and, and across Asia, there has been a major shift from the public sector to the private sector in the past. And, and, and I think now is the time that that can be accelerated through uh, closer collaboration. Uh, Alberto, I'll come to you. What, what, what areas of, of partnership have you seen locally in Bali and, and across Indonesia that have been a success? Thanks, Adrian. Um, <clears throat> Before I go there, I think I think one of the things that the pandemic has shown, not only in Asia, but across the world, is that when it comes to risk management, uh, especially tail risk events like the pandemic, that the world has, is unprepared, right? Uh, and, and I'm not saying it's unprepared because they haven't thought about it, but one thing is to think about it, and one thing is to have in your drawer a roadmap that you can pull out and basically, um, uh, you know, execute the plan. Uh, I'm amazed about Brussels and the 5,000 people uh, that uh, are still struggling to coordinate their efforts. So <clears throat> the consequence for this, and now I'm, I'm, I'm trying to close the loop, has been that I think across the globe, uh, but also in, in Indonesia, the response has been slow. Um, and I think it has been too slow and, and it, it has in particular affected the, the, the social demographic group we're talking about, the unprivileged, because they don't have reserves, right? They don't have savings for six months running the operations. And that's why it hit them so hard. And when I look at what the government has done in terms of, uh, you know, they quickly announced that they will, uh, you can apply and, and the government will give you uh, subsidies and, and support you, but until it was paid, it was too late. Okay, and so what people done is they tried to survive and take on debt and 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 and, and shifting. Um, so that's on the government side. On the private sector side, I, I'm a little bit more optimistic. I think people have been very creative uh, to come up with solution. Obviously, technology has helped. So. Very quickly, I saw many of, for example, restaurants and in, in the hospitality that came up with an online solution, right? Whether it's a takeaway. Um, and they, if you're under pressure, you have to be innovative, right? Uh, and they tried to do that. And, and they partnered up um, and, and tried to create cooperatives and support each other. So I, that is the beauty of Asia, I think, that this, this sense of community is very strong. And I think it helped. In the absence of a, a structural or government driven plan um, that was quickly implemented. So I, I think that is, that is beautiful. Um, but of course, uh, it's not enough. And so we still seeing that a lot of people do not have access to that. Um, and, and, and could not jump on that train, whether it's in the private sector with, with corporations or, or government driven. Um, and that's unfortunately the, you know, the truth of the matter, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, some some excellent points there, Edgar, uh, uh, Alberto. Clearly, digitization has been the benefit beneficiary of of uh, COVID, and many people have been brought into uh, the economic 
productive society through the the acceleration of digitization across Asia. And and hopefully that's going to be something that can leverage uh, uh, industry 4.0 across uh, all forms. We have about four or five minutes left. So, um, Edgar, begin I'd to like hear. To say oh, something. Claire, yes, go ahead. Okay, please do. Thank you. Uh, I think about. Uh, <laughs> we can hear you. Hey, about. Uh, can you hear me? You guys hear me? Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think I've got to mention something very important. The corporate, private sector, or the government they really need to do something. They need to actually work to, together from bottom to, to top, um, not just only the top to the bottom. Um, government, they have a different kind of subsidies. Assist, you know, for the helping those uh, people who already doesn't have income or middle class become got into the poverty, stuff like that. Business doesn't go well, and when those uh, those uh, the funds or from the government, uh, the private sector or or some corporate company actually applied it. So it's not. That's what I think in many. A government in, in different country in Asia. So, if you're some corporate company or private sector, and you're not, you, the, the government support to those companies because the company is losing a uh, revenue. But what about other regular people? So, I think they need to take account uh, seriously to think about what this is not a decor system. And on the other hand, uh, I would like to mention again, the logistics is a very big problem. So government need to do something to support the logistics. Um, invest the fund and, and, and uh, invest in uh, aviation, cargoes, uh, transportation. That's a key because that's a supply chain. Otherwise, everyone, when, when you develop to everyone, uh, every country in entire Asia, the, the pricing of the food or everything, either shortage or just like triple price. How can people to afford it? You will see the next, uh, this year is coming 2022 or 2023. And it's a uh, you know, so I think really, even though we say government is kind of too late, but they can do something. And uh, I hope more corporate companies can come together, work together with government and give them some advice. I hope people can hear our, our voice to help those people. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Edgar. I can't hear you yet, Edgar. There yeah, you thank go. you. Anna. Sorry. Um, you know, the, the pandemic situation um, uh, reminds me of the saying or the song, my best is not good enough. So whether it's government, whether it's private sector, whether it's a cultural leader, a political leader, business leader, we cannot do enough to meet the needs of everyone. And this is really the test to us, as mentioned earlier, of humanity. How do we survive? Because... While it is not bad to rely on somebody, but at the end of the day, that somebody also has his own situation. And we have millions of examples on how people cope with everything, whether on the business side, the technology side. But as Alberto I mentioned, I guess, on the Asian culture, we have a, just a unique way of you know, having that sense of community and family. And, of course, God, you know, uh, not as a last resort. We have the capacity to imbue in our survival the presence of that Almighty in whatever way we call Him. When there's nothing else, we look up and pray. I mean, it's a sense of survival or staying uh, uh, sane. So that's just my take on, on that. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, thank you very much. Well, we've come to the end of this session and, and clearly... Uh, there's great consensus on the role of, of collaboration between the private and public sector. Sushma, you've given some excellent examples of where uh, some real initiatives can be led through uh, through, through the public partnership uh, and a deliberate initiative to focus on key areas. Uh, Alberto, I think you've highlighted very effectively um, the uh, the role that, uh, that that society has in in underpinning not just the short term but the future through pensions as well, which I think is going to be an enormous further problem because people will not have saved at the base of the pyramid through this. Uh, and and both Claire and and uh, Edgar, with your own experiences, talking about the challenges of logistics, supply chains, and the f the food and and general price inflation that that's causing. Um, so. 
Uh, it's been a wonderful discussion, always too brief, and um, I'm afraid it was remote as opposed to in-person in Asia this year. But uh, on behalf of uh, SANMS4 and Harassis Asia 2021, I'd like to thank those that joined and um, wish you all a healthy and prosperous future. Thank you very much. I want to thank you, Andrew, the wonderful host and wonderful Mark. Thank you. Thank you very yeah, much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.